was made at 7.44 that evening. All that Mandy Joseph could scream down the phone at that point was, help, help. There were sounds of a gunshot and a woman screaming for help. And then the line went dead. There's been a murder. I said, well, what do you mean there's been a murder? He said, yeah, they found two women murdered up by the garage. It's got to be them. It's something that is totally unbelievable to kill them both. It was just devastating. And you just could never, ever imagine something like that happening in Oakleaf. It was vicious in the extreme. When officers reviewed the CCTV, they identified a vehicle that came down the pathway around the time of the murder, and these are the people responsible for the death. Hockliffe, a quintessentially English village situated in the heart of Bedfordshire, best known for being the birthplace of British explorer Arthur Henry Newman. Hockliffe is a smallish village uh, in mid-Bedfordshire, um, straddles the A5. It's a quiet village. Um, it's on a route between Dunstable in the south and Milton Keynes in the north. Everyone knows everyone, really, so it's, it's quite a nice little place to, to live and to stay and to be, really. It's a lovely local community with a pub and a lovely little school. There's not a lot of trouble. It's a good little village. I'd say the community is quite close-knit. A lot of people know a lot of other people, so everyone kind of knows everybody. And central to the community and village life was Iris Jones and her husband. Iris was a much-loved figure in the village, well-known in the village. She'd lived here for years and years. Um, she was known especially for the fact that she had fostered something like 120 children, um, she and her husband, um, over a sort of 30-year period, starting in the 50s and, and going through to the mid-1980s. She was a woman who had fostered over 100 children. The local community held her in the highest regard. She literally was an angel walking amongst us. Auntie was, once you got to know her, she had a heart of gold. And she'd do anything for anybody. She was much loved, uh, a caring, compassionate person who opened up her home uh, to countless children, uh, less fortunate. I mean, it become a way of life to her, fostering several children there who we actually grew up with. And as I say, she was, that, that was her life, kids, really. Iris's husband died in 1993, leaving Iris a widower. She remained close to her children, including her foster daughter, Mandy, whom she relied on. Mandy Jones was fostered by Iris when she was about four years old. She's um, had a proper mother-daughter relationship um, throughout her whole life. Mandy was 34 years old. Um, she was a carer herself. She worked in the care industry. Her whole life was about caring for others. And when Iris's husband died, uh, she moved back in with her foster mother to care for her in her declining health. She was a caring girl. There was no nothing she wouldn't do for you. Iris uh, walked with the aid of a, a, a frame uh, and walking stick. She had heart problems. She had diabetes and she had failing eyesight. In later years, as Iris's health declined, Mandy took a much more active role in the care of her foster mother, uh, looking after her, caring for, making sure she had everything she needed. Oh, please, so can I help? The 999 call was made at 7.44 that evening and it was made by Mandy Joseph. 
all that Mandy Joseph could scream down the phone at that point was, help, help. Then the line went dead. If a 999 call is cut off or goes dead for whatever reason, um, the operator will review what they've already heard. In this case, there was a, a, a woman screaming for help, so they would then dispatch units to the house. Mandy's screams were not the only disturbing sound the police operator heard. There were sounds of a gunshot, a, a woman screaming for help, and the control room inspector would then decide on the appropriate level of, uh, of response because of the high level of risk to both the officers attending and the public. It's a proportionate response to dispatch a firearms team. In this case, it was always going to be a firearms team. The call handers did try to call back, and there was no response, but the police were able to trace where the call had been made from. And that resulted in police being sent to the property, including armed police officers, uh, who falsely gained entry into the house that evening. The house where the shooting had taken place was up a, a gravel drive and situated behind a garage forecourt. There's a petrol station, and by the side of it, there was a track that led down to this detached house. Upon arrival, the armed officers were met with a gruesome sight. They found Iris. Uh, she was lying by the sink. Uh, a further search of the house um, located Mandy in, in the lounge. The women had been shot. Um, Iris had been shot twice. Mandy had been shot four times. Shotgun cartridges were found at the house. Uh, so it's, it was clear to the police officers um, that uh, it was a, a, a shotgun killing of both women. Immediately, police get to work preserving the scene. Once the scene's been cordoned off, um, We'll be thinking about fast track actions. Um, what is it that we can do now um, to, to move the investigation on? The house was set back from the road, so was there any CCTV that, that could be uh, reviewed straight away? Um, what we want to do is try and identify the offenders as soon as possible. We were sitting here watching telly, and all we could hear was sirens and a lot of commotion. And I went out and I could see the helicopter flying over auntie's house. And I come in and I said, there's something up to the wife. And at the time we had a phone and I rung up my father and I said, there's something going on up auntie's house and then my father rung me and said there's been a murder and I I said well what do you mean there's been a murder he said yeah they found two women murdered up by the garage and then the bell began to sink in and I can remember my father saying to me then, uh, it's got to be them. And uh, that was a shock and half when we knew it was both, both of them. Quick assessments of the house revealed that there was no one else on the scene. However, it appeared that some items had gone missing. A DVD was taken, um, the women's handbags were taken. The motive looked like it was burglary. Was this a burglary gone wrong? It was just devastating, absolutely devastating. And you just could never, ever imagine something like that happening in Ockliffe. I think everyone talks to everybody, and it would be a very short period of time until everyone knew the situation. I mean, this is, this is a quiet area. People will tell you that. It was quiet then, it's quiet now. Um, to get a, a double shooting, two people dead, 
in the village. Um, truly exceptional. And the question on everybody's lips was, who had committed such a heinous murder? In a little, little village or little villages, things spread quite quick. And people were all concerned because things like that don't happen. It's uh, a nightmare. <sighs> this was a shocking crime for the village of Hockliffe. Somebody using that amount of force on two um, helpless women uh, has only one intention, and that is to kill them. In the quiet Bedfordshire village of Hockliffe, news has spread of the brutal murder of Iris Jones and her foster daughter, Mandy Joseph. This is the house where Iris Jones and her late husband Clifford cared for 120 foster children. But this kindness was to prove her downfall. The local community, and it was a quiet little area, were obviously shocked by the whole incident and very sad at the loss of two well-respected members of the community. Everyone knew about it. Um, it was the talk of the village. Um, I, uh, as I moved along the high street, um, talking to people, um, everyone was aware of what had happened. Lots of people knew uh, Iris Jones, uh, knew Mandy, and um, they were just stunned that uh, two pillars of the community, two kind, caring people, should have had their lives ended in such a way. To me, as silly as it sounds, it's a bit like when Lady Di died, all went quiet, you know? And I think that's how it was. Um, there was so many police, police around and all that lot, but it shocked everyone, really shocked, shocked the villages, not just Ockliffe. With fear spreading through the community, police need to quickly establish the circumstances around the murders. Once the scene's been called off, the police will look for any fast-track actions, so anything that, that can lead them to the identity of suspects or, or the offenders. Um, and that will include um, any passive data like um, CCTV, AMPR, any phone work that can be done. But it will also include speaking to witnesses, the suspects, but also um, what we call victimology. If you find out how a person lived, you may find out how they died. Post-mortem results reveal that Iris was shot twice and Mandy four times using a shotgun. This is a, a very brutal murder. The way both Iris and Mandy have been gunned down with a shotgun, it's absolutely, yeah, it is, it's top-scale brutal. It was vicious in the extreme. Mandy had been shot in the chest and also in the hand, which, um, shattered the mobile phone she was holding to make the 999 call. So that's why it abruptly ended. Upon realizing what was happening, she ran to the phone, dialed 999, and was screaming for help. But the phone was shot out of her hand, and, and this was confirmed by the pathologist uh, during their post-mortem. With the emergency call cutting out when Mandy was shot, police confirm the time of death as 7.45 p.m so can start to piece together Iris and Mandy's last known movements. The police have been out talking to residents in the area, doing house-to-house -house inquiries. And of course, they'd also made inquiries with the garage forecourt, where uh, there was a shop, and they spoke to the staff there. Mandy had finished her shift at the, the care home in Luton, where she worked, and had arrived home, um, but first she called up the garage forecourt and went into the shop uh, to buy some items, um, fire lighters, um, because I think the plan was to have a, a log fire that evening. Uh, so she brought fire lighters, um, she brought some cigarettes, um, said hello to the staff uh, before going back up to the house. And inquiries at the garage give police their first breakthrough. That garage forecourt was subject to CCTV, which was handed over to the police. 
The thing with this investigation is we can time the 999 call. So um, one of the fast track actions would be to review any CCTV in the area around that time. Um, and an obvious one was the garage forecourt because you had to drive past that or, th or through it to get to Iris's house. When officers reviewed the CCTV, they identified a vehicle uh, that came down the pathway and back out onto the A6 um, around the time of the murder. And one sees this people carrier moving in the distance, moving past the garage uh, along the track. And it was at a time which was about 10 minutes after a 999 call had been made from the house. And that's what led the police to go uh, to find um, and identify who was driving the vehicle and so on. Once we have the registration number of the vehicle, um, it was flagged on the police national computer uh, to be stopped and checked and reported back to Bedfordshire. Because they may be witnesses to the offence, they also may be the offenders. So it's imperative that we find them as soon as possible because we can put them in the area of the murder at the time it happened. A day after the murder and police track down the car in Suffolk. Inside is a couple. But that's not all. When they searched the vehicle, they found a shotgun in the back. Once the police find a shotgun in the rear of the vehicle, um, then they were arrested on suspicion of murder straight away because we've got two victims with shotgun wounds. So you've got your suspicion straight away. The police told us on that Monday they had arrested the couple along with a 14-year-old boy. Police named the couple arrested as 36-year-old Anita Mansfield and her husband, 46-year-old Michael Milcroft, as well as an unnamed teenager. Where a shotgun has been used or a firearm has been used, it's vital that we identify everybody who may have been responsible or may have come into contact with the weapon. So in this case, um, the police forensically examined uh, the 14-year-old boy and that examination revealed that he had gunshot residue on him. He's showered um, with gunshot debris. So he was at the scene of the crime. So that's where the police start accusing him of being part of the murder. Once suspects are arrested in a case, that's just the start of the work for the police. There's a huge amount of forensic work that has to be done. We have to carry out searches at their home address uh, or home addresses. Um, and we have to speak to witnesses or people that knew them and dig into their background as well to see if there's any motive that we can identify. Police start by looking into the backgrounds of Anita Mansfield and Michael Milcroft to see how they could be linked to Mandy and Iris. Anita Mansfield was someone um, Michael Milcroft met uh, in the 1980s. Uh, he met her in a pub in Dunstable. Uh, they quickly formed a relationship. He then married Anita Mansfield and they had a family together. We do know that he may have worked as a, a, a pop man, um, a helper in a, in a local pub in Leighton Buzzard at one stage, but uh, to all intents and purposes, he was unemployed. He was a carer for an, Anita. She didn't work. She had health issues to the extent that uh, she told people she, she couldn't work. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of her neighbors um, thought this was a bit of a sham and that she was using uh, her, her poor health as, as a meal ticket was the way it was described. She was claiming benefits, but always had um, delusions of grandeur. She craved a more uh, affluent lifestyle. Information found at the couple's home at the time of the arrest reveals they were on the verge of moving. Millcroft and Mansfield had, had set their hearts on buying a large country house in Suffolk. Um, really, they, they wanted to put their lives on a sound financial footing. They had lived a nomadic life of uh, living a very much uh, hand-to-mouth existence. 
They wanted to buy a big house uh, for the family. They'd found a house to move to, the dream home, which I think was one of the most expensive properties in the area. Uh, and uh, they wanted to go to that home with its swimming pool and so on. And so the house in near Beckles, that became the house of the, their dreams. And it was, uh, it was on the market, I think, for 740,000 pounds. The purchase should have gone through in the December of 2004. But again, Millcroft and Mansfield weren't ready. They hadn't got the, the funds. And so a new date uh, was arrived at, which was February 28. Millcroft and Mansfield were pulling the wool over the, the seller's eyes um, in relation to um, the funding for buying their house. With the couple living on state benefits and with no savings, police are perplexed as to how they can afford such an expensive new home. But it's not long before officers discover something of interest. They were renting um, a property and searches of that property found um, documents belonging to Mandy Joseph in the house itself. The documents are revealed to be life insurance policies taken out by Mandy Joseph 18 months earlier. She took out two uh, with different companies. One was Norwich Union and one was Zurich Insurance. Further investigations reveal that in the event of Mandy's death, her beneficiary named in the policies would receive a staggering £800,000. And this beneficiary was named as Anita Oakfield Bennett, also known as Anita Mansfield. Suddenly, police believe they have a motive for murder. For the insurance companies to pay out, Mandy Joseph had to die. Police investigating the murders of Mandy Joseph and Iris Jones have arrested a couple. Anita Mansfield and Michael Millcroft, alongside a 14-year-old boy. A search of the couple's home uncovers life insurance documents in the name of Mandy Joseph, which would pay out £800,000 to Anita Mansfield if she died. Their plan was to get their hands on around £800,000 and unknown to Mandy, um, Anita Mansfield had taken out life insurance on her life um, so that in the event of Mandy's death, the money from two life insurance policies would come to Mansfield and Millcroft. You can't just go out and take an insurance policy on somebody. Um, there has to be a lot of deception involved. And in this case, they deceived both Mandy and the insurance company. The couple were extremely cunning all the way through. They built up a picture of Mandy's medical history. They had documents belonging to Mandy they shouldn't have had. Um, they had a mobile phone of Mandy's that uh, was taken from the house. Again, it was, they, these were all things that could provide them with details of Mandy that would help them uh, in the, uh, the plan to set up these bogus insurance policies. Police now believe Anita and Michael fraudulently set up the insurance policies to help fund a new lifestyle. The plan was to buy this large mansion with the proceeds of, of, of that insurance policy. There were policies apparently taken out on the life of Mandy and they would have uh, provided uh, the husband and wife defendants uh, with a beautiful home with swimming pool and all sorts of other good qualities. To get the money, Mandy Joseph had to die, and that meant um, they had to kill her. But the question still remains. How are Anita and Michael connected to their victims, Mandy and Iris? Michael Millcroft was the foster son of 
Iris Jones. He had gone to live with Iris and her family in 1959 when he was just 10 days old. And Iris gave um, a stable home uh, full of love and, and, and warmth to, to lots and lots of children. And Michael Millcroft was one of them. So at the age of 10 days old, he was, he was living with Iris and brought up by Iris and her late husband and, part, and became part of the family. So for his whole life, Iris was his mother. I remember Michael, yeah, I, he, he'd be a bit younger than me. He used to play with us as kids. He was part of our family. It was said that Michael regarded Mandy as his, his si younger sister. Um, she looked at, on him as an older brother. Um, they were brought up together as children. They sat round the dinner table, went on holidays together. At one stage, Michael's girlfriend, Anita, even moved into the home with him. But in 1989, it seems there was a divide in the family. Iris and Mandy, Michael and Anita had all gone on holiday to Mallorca. There was a big row while on holiday, with the result that when everyone returned, Michael and Anita Mansfield moved out. And that really marked the 12 year gap in things because uh, he stayed away from Iris and Mandy for all that time and didn't come back into their lives until around 2000. When Michael came back, he changed his name. He was always uh, known as Michael Jones. He'd taken Iris's name. But he was now calling himself Michael Millcroft. And he was married uh, to Anita. They'd started a family. And he was unemployed. It's believed that this is the point in which the couple devised their devious plan. For that to happen by a foster brother is just... Um, you, you wouldn't put that, would you? It's, it's something that is totally unbelievable to think that money corrupts everything. Um, to kill them both, uh, nightmare, nightmare. You know, we kept thinking to ourselves, no, it can't be Michael what's done it. With news sinking in that Iris' own foster son could be behind her murder, forensic evidence comes in. We have the forensic evidence, uh, DNA on the um, triggers of the shotgun, um, victim's blood um, on the shotgun, as well as Mansfield's DNA. These are the people responsible for the deaths. Police present all their evidence against Anita Mansfield, Michael Millcroft and the teenager to the Crown Prosecution Service. And they uh, decided to charge them with murder. There were murder counts and also counts of attempting to obtain money by deception. With the three pleading not guilty to murder, preparation begins to build a case for trial starting with trying to prove that the couple had taken out the fraudulent insurance policy. Anita did much of the setting up over the phone. She would ring an insurance company, pretended to be Mandy Joseph, and proceeded to give Mandy's medical history, um, saying what she smoked in a week, what alcohol intake, a general medical history, that sort of thing. These were all details that she had somehow gleaned over the last few years in the, the build-up uh, to the killings, and uh, it helped her in the pretense that she was Mandy Joseph on the phone. With the policy set up, there was only one thing left to do. Mandy's death was essential for the claim to be made on insurance. It was a racing certainty that Iris would be in the cottage because at that time she was housebound. So they both had to be killed if they were going to succeed in getting the insurance money. It's hard to believe that anybody thought they could get away with it. 
I mean, to us, you've got to be a little bit sick in the head to think that you can get a, away with something like that to start off with. With the trial looming, defence barristers are appointed for the three defendants. I've done many murder trials, either prosecuting or defending. The first I knew about this case was I was instructed in the autumn of 2005. And because the police and the CPS uh, had chosen to charge the boy with being a murderer, uh, he went into custody. So he's remanded in custody and he goes to a small specialist unit where I visited him. But there was one piece of information which hadn't yet been revealed about the 14-year-old boy. He was their son. And I think potentially the most evil part of the case was that the parents thought they could blame their son and get away with it. In Bedfordshire, Michael Milcroft, Anita Mansfield and their own son have pleaded not guilty to the murder of Iris Jones and her foster daughter, Mandy Joseph. The trial begins at Luton Crown Court. The defendants in the case were uh, a mother who complained of ill health, a father who was a rather pathetic sort of individual, and their 14-year-old son who left the premises covered in uh, gum powder. What was revealed in court was the lens that they went to to plan this murder. The court hears exactly what unfolded on that fateful day. It was just an ordinary day. It was a Sunday afternoon. It was known that uh, Millcroft and Mansfield were coming to the house that evening. Uh, and that's one of the reasons uh, that she called into the shop, because uh, the plan was to have a log fire burning for them when they arrived to make it homely and welcoming. And so Mandy had called into the shop to buy um, fire lighters and uh, to help get the fire going. Iris, he was waiting for him in the kitchen, having made a cup of tea and got a a log fire roaring. The first shot would have been delivered to the foster mother. She goes down on the ground in the kitchen. Mandy came into the kitchen, having heard the shot, and received the second barrel. Uh, she staggered out of the kitchen and the son was able to describe to me that uh, his father, having fumbled with the shotgun, reloaded it, went out into the hallway and shot uh, Mandy a second time. At one point, Mandy Joseph had been on her knees, um, having received a, a shotgun blast, but she was still on her knees when she was shot again. Mandy still wasn't dead, so he fired in bullets, uh, shotgun into her again a couple of times, and uh, then returned to the kitchen where his foster mother was still breathing. So she heard the killing, and he fired at her, finally killing her, and then left the premises. In those last seconds of their lives, um, for Mandy, and Iris, it must have been truly terrifying. In the execution of their crime, the couple went to great lengths to make sure their plan didn't fail. They even planned to alter the shot in the shotgun cartridge. Normally, a shotgun cartridge will fire small ball bearings and, and they will spread out into a certain pattern. 
In this case, they used hard, uh, harder and larger ball bearings. Um, absolutely lethal uh, and illegal to, to change the shot as well. The jury also hears how the couple went even further to try to distance themselves from the crime by blaming their son. Here were two defendants saying that it was the third defendant that did it. They were totally innocent. If there was any dishonesty shown by them when they were first seen by the police, it was because they wanted to protect the boy. That was their story. His story, of course, was that he simply wasn't involved. I think potentially the most evil part of the case was that the parents thought they could blame their son and get away with it. I relied upon the 14-year-old boy, he was then 15 when I represented him, relied on his recollection. He was the only witness to the killing, and his recollection was clear, and it seemed to fit in with other evidence. The young boy was able to tell the police that he was aware that Millcroft and Mansfield had been planning the deaths of the women for some time and that various ways of killing them had been discussed and, and thought about. They sent the 14-year-old son to the library to research on poisoning. He did what he was told. He went and looked in the library and read about one or two things and reported back on it. Researching not just an insurance scam followed by a shooting, but other methods that uh, how Mandy should be killed, um, including looking into poisoning her, looking into electrocuting her, um, looking into uh, masonry, heavy masonry falling onto her, or that she would be the victim of a mugging gone wrong. But it was clear um, from the evidence that was presented that they've manipulated him as he was growing up. Anita's defense um, mirrored that of her husband. Both claimed they heard the firearm discharged and the father left the vehicle and uh, went in and found this dreadful scene. She claimed to have remained in the vehicle uh, outside the cottage. Her, her husband went in and then left a few minutes later together with um, the boy. The thing I remember most about this investigation was the sheer callousness and brutality of the murder, and the callousness to um, take out life insurance policies because they wanted a house, and the brutality to murder two innocent women so that you can buy that house. It's just, it's evil. After weeks of hearing evidence, the jury retires to consider their verdict. The 14-year-old boy was found not guilty in this case. He wasn't wicked, and he wasn't a killer. And that's what the jury must have been satisfied for by, at the end of their deliberations, that he had not been proved to be any part of the murder. Then the jury delivers its verdict against Anita Mansfield and Michael Millcroft. The evidence in this case was overwhelming. We have the forensic evidence um, there's Millcroft's fingerprints on the trigger uh, of the shotgun, as well as Mansfield's DNA. The 14-year-old boy had shotgun residue uh, on his person. Um, we've also got the CCTV from the time of the murder, um, and we've also got the shotgun found uh, in the back of Millcroft's car. Adding to that, the documentation belonging to Mandy Joseph found at the rented um, property in Suffolk as well as all the financial documents which identified fraudulent life insurance policies. So, yeah, pretty damning. And it appears the jury agreed. Both were found guilty of murder. Anita Mansfield received a sentence of 30 years, and Michael Millcroft uh, received a sentence of 25 years. Mansfield got the longer sentence, 
because the judge found that she had been the prime mover in what happened. In putting together the plan, she had been the cold, calculated director of operations. Millcroft had very much been a passenger in what happened. And the reality was that this was a vicious, mean, wicked killing. And I seem to remember an observation by the judge that they had shown no remorse at any time, and that was clearly the case. The judge said this was, um, it was no sudden spur of the moment killing. They never once apologized for, um, for what had happened. Um, they showed no remorse. And the case has left its mark. When you leave the court afterwards, you never forget the tragedy of the death of the two women. I think the saddest thing about this crime is how little um, Millcroft and Mansfield valued the lives of, of, the, of their family. What the, why they done it, I'd, well, I know why they done it, they done it for money, but why anyone would think they could get away with it, it's quite unbelievable, really. I've been a policeman now for nearly 29 years and I've, I've dealt with some very nasty people, but I've never come across any people quite so evil. Following the sentencing of Millcroft and Mansfield, Iris's natural son, Brian, revealed how his mum would have been looking forward to her foster son's visit on that fateful day. First thing she'd do would be at the kitchen sink to make a cup of tea. And uh, that's how she would have greeted them. Hello, love, do you want a cup of tea? And then they shot her. I mean, Mandy would still be here now, and even today. There's not many days you don't... Something triggers your mind and you think of Mandy and our, my auntie Iris. That's all I can really say. The death of, of Iris and Mandy, these were women that had given their lives to, to, to helping and caring for other people. Iris especially, she had taken Michael into her arms when he was just 10 days old. Truly, truly shocking and uh, really, really upsetting. <laughs>